good morning. morning. Yes, I am limping. Uh, I thought I was trying to be 26 when I'm actually 46. Tore my meniscus, but don't worry, it'll be fixed in like a month. So if you see me limping, don't feel sorry for me. It's my own fault. But with that, happy St. Patrick's Day. You know, St. Patrick's Day is not just an excuse to eat some corned beef and cabbage or to wear some, uh, you know, Lucky Charm socks or, uh, you know, maybe drink a, a green beverage or two. It, there's, there's actually a thing behind St. Patty's Day. You see, Patrick is a real person. St. Patrick's a real person. In fact, when he was 16, he was kidnapped by Irish raiders, taken back to Ireland and made a slave. And then as time went on, he, he got free, he, he escaped, and he, he went back home to Europe. And, and the crazy part was, is that God called him back to Ireland, to the people who kidnapped him and enslaved him, to proclaim his freedom and forgiveness. Stop and think about that for a second. How crazy is that? To let those savages know that they are connected to Christ's cross just as we are. And so this morning, as we worship our Lord, as we hear his word, as we receive his sacraments, may he bless us and guide us. May he assure us that we have forgiveness and freedom in him, that we are connected to him. Amen? Amen. It's our tradition in this place to stand at the first hymn as the cross processes in to, to remind us that Christ is present here. So I invite you to stand. In the name of the triune God, keeper of an everlasting covenant, source of steadfast love, our Redeemer and our rock, our guide and the way, God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, Amen. please join me now in time of confessing our sins and receiving God's grace and mercy through His Son. Merciful God, forgive us, our will is bound to sin and we cannot break free. Forgive us for when we have spoken, but we should have kept quiet. Forgive us for when we were silent, but we should have said something. Forgive us for when we acted, but we knew better. 
Forgive us for when we stood still, but we should have stepped up or stepped in. Forgive us for the wrong we have done and for the good we have failed to do. Have mercy on us for the sake of Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord. In his mercy, God has given his Son to die for you and for his sake forgives you all your sin. Therefore, as a called servant of the Lord, I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Please be seated. Good morning, church. First reading is from the Old Testament, Jeremiah chapter 31, verses 31 through 34. The days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new promise to Israel and Judah. It will not be like the promise that I made to their ancestors when I took them by the hand and brought them out of Egypt. They rejected that promise, although I was a husband to them, declares the Lord. But this is the promise that I will make to Israel in all those days 
<clears throat> declares the Lord. I will put my teachings inside them, and I will write those teachings on their heart, and I will be their God, and they will be my people. No longer will each person teach his neighbor or his relatives by saying, Know the Lord. All of them from the least important to the most important will know me, declares the Lord, because I will forgive their weaknesses, and I will no longer hold their sins against them. Second reading is from the New Testament, from the Epistle of Hebrews, chapter 5, verses 1 through 10. Every chief priest is chosen from husbands to represent them in front of God, that is, to offer gifts and sacrifices for sin. The chief priest can be gentle with people who are ignorant and easily deceived because he, has, because he also has weaknesses. Because he has weaknesses, he has to offer sacrifices for his own sins in the same way that he does for the sins of his people. No one takes this honor for himself. Instead, God, God calls him as he called Aaron, so Christ did not take the glory of being a chief priest for himself. Instead, the glory was given to him by God, who said, You are my son. Today I have become your father. In another place in Scripture, God said, You are a priest forever, in the way Melchizedek was a priest. During his life on earth, Jesus prayed to God, who could save him from death. He prayed and pleaded with loud crying and tears, and he was heard because of his devotion to God. Although Jesus was the Son of God, he learned to be obedient through his sufferings, and he had to finish his work. He became the source of eternal salvation for everyone who obeys him. God appointed him chief priest in the way Melchizedek was a, was a priest. I'd like to invite uh, the children forward for the children's message. No, I can't. Okay. 
All right, I'm coming. I had to get my act together here. And I don't mean act by act. I mean, I'm just getting myself together. I should have said that way. Oh, bless you. Bless you. Well, boys and girls, good morning. Now, we want to talk about something called a cross. If you look around in the church, where do you see one? Just start pointing. There, where else? There, where else? Yep, yep, there, yep. Where else do you see one? Do you, do you see one? Yeah, that's right on Mr. Carl's, around his neck, that's a cross. There's one up there. Oh, boy, you guys are sure good. That's what we're talking about today, crosses. Yeah, you can stop pointing now, that's okay. Um, we got a whole bunch of them. Do you like the raccoon better than me? I still like the raccoon. Is, is this one okay? Well, you'd rather hear this one? Is that what you're selling me? You, you, like, you, like, you like both of them. It's awfully tough for me to go back and forth like that. <laughs> I got to stick with one for a while, <laughs> and then I can do this one, okay? Now, I know, that's how I feel sometimes too. So, here we go, there's two of us up here, and part of what I want to do right now is I'm going to sing a little song about a cross. I need my friend to hold it here for me, and he's doing a good job. Here we go. In the cross of Christ I glory, Towering o'er the wrecks of time, all the light of sacred story gathers round its head sublime. Well, did you hear in that, in that song? No, please don't. Now, in that song, what word did you hear? You heard cross, that's right. And it says, in the cross of Christ I glory. That means that we are supposed to be happy about the cross that Jesus had. All right? Now my friend is going to sing the other song, and you listen to his. <clears throat> Faithful cross, true son of triumph, before all the noblest tree, none in foliage, none in blossom, none in fruit thine equal be. Symbol of the world's redemption, for the weight that hung on thee. Well, what was the word in that one that you heard? What was the word? The important word? Cross. cross. It was cross again. That's right. We're talking about the cross that Jesus died on. Now, one other thing as we wrap this up is... Jesus had to carry his cross, and uh, it was awfully difficult for him. And you know what? He even needed some help. Now, boys and girls, I think what my friend is trying to tell you is we have crosses to bear too. Things that bother us, things that are hard. Like, can you tell me anything that bothers you sometimes or something that's really hard? Go ahead. Sometimes when you get hit, it hurts. Yeah, anything else that bothers you sometimes? Go ahead. 
Sometimes you get annoyed by brothers and sisters. Yep, I can, I can sure remember that because I grew up with two sisters and they were awfully annoying. That's right. <laughs> what else bothers you sometimes? Her sister is an expert yapper, and I like to say that word, yapper. That works real good. Ha <laughs> ha, let's hear just a couple more. What bothers you? Like, when I get a really good thought at the doctor, it really makes me cry. I know. Sometimes I cry too when that happens. One more thing. You got hit or hurt on the cheek a little bit. So those are things that we suffer with. Now here's the thing, even when there's sufferings and bad things, we have people who can help us too. Mommies or daddies, grandmas or grandpas, sometimes your brothers and sisters, but they can help you carry your cross. That's right, boys and girls, we're all going to have crosses to carry, but the last thing you got to know is Jesus died on the cross. Did he stay dead? No. No. On the third day, what? He rose again from the dead and he defeated sin, death, and the devil. So when you look... When you look at a cross, you remember that important thing that our Savior did for us. Let's pray. Great God, Heavenly Father, we praise your name and thank you for these boys and girls. Watch over them and keep them. Whenever they have troubles or things that are hard, help them to know that they don't have to carry it alone. Just like, dear Jesus, you didn't carry your cross alone but you suffered and died on it for all of us, and we are so very, very grateful. Be with these children and their families. Bless them and hold them in the very palm of your hand. It's in your name I pray. Amen. Thank you, boys and girls, for coming. There's under grace and under aid if you're for that, and you can go, and that looks very nice too. Thank you. Please stand if you're able. <clears throat> this is a gospel. It was written by Mark. Jesus and his disciples were on their way to Jerusalem. Jesus was walking ahead of them. His disciples were shocked that he was going to Jerusalem. The others who followed were afraid. Once again, he took the twelve apostles aside and began to tell them what, he was, going to, what was going to happen to him. We're going to Jerusalem. There, the Son of Man will be betrayed to the chief priests and the experts in Moses' teaching. They will condemn him to death and hand him over to foreigners. They will make fun of him, spit on him, whip him, and kill him. But after three days, he will come back to life. James and John, sons of Zebedee, went to Jesus. They said to him, Hey, teacher, we want you to do us a favor. What do you want me to do? He asked them. They said to him, Let one of us sit at your right, and the other sit at your left in glory. Jesus said, You don't realize what you're asking. Can you drink that cup I'm going to drink? Can you be baptized with the baptism that I'm going to receive? We can, they told him. Jesus told them, You will drink the cup that I'm, you will drink the cup that I'm going to drink. You will be baptized with the baptism that I'm going to receive but I don't have the authority to grant you a seat at my right or left. Those positions have already been prepared for certain people. When the other ten apostles heard about it, they were irritated with James and John. Jesus called the apostles and said, You know that the acknowledged rulers of the nations have absolute power over people and their officials and have absolute authority over people, but that's not the way it's going to be among you. Whoever wants to become great among you will be your servant. Whoever wants to be most important among you will be a slave for everyone. It's the same way the Son of Man. 
He didn't come so that others could serve him. He came to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many people. This is the word of God. Good morning again. I got no puppets. Sorry. But I got to say, before I begin this morning, I got to say what a blessing it is to have Carl here as a part of our staff. Amen? Amen. I, I love his puppetry. You never know what's going to come out of the kids' mouths. You never know what's going to come out of Carl's mouth. It's such a blessing to all of us. This morning, as we begin our message, we begin looking at that gospel lesson. I got a question for you. Have you ever been in a situation where you told someone, here's what's about to happen, or you gave them step-by-step instructions, and then their response to your instructions is like, does this person even have a clue right now? It happens all the time in parenting, right? Imagine with you, if you will, you're, uh, you're getting home late one night, you've been out to dinner doing something with the kids, right? You look at your watch and you realize, oh my goodness, we got to get the kids to bed. We got school in the morning, right? So you look at your kids and you say, okay, I want to make this very clear. We're going to go inside the house. I'm going to get your pajamas. You're going to go brush your teeth and wash your face. You're going to put your clothes on. We're going to pray and you're going to bed. You have school in the morning. Do you understand? And they're like, yeah, right? And then they run in there and they're getting dressed and everything's going on, right? And then all of a sudden you walk in, you're like, okay, we're ready to pray. And they're like, can we watch a movie? And you want to look at it and be like, do you understand the words that are coming out of my mouth, right? 
It's frustrating. And I'm sure that's kind of how Jesus felt in our text this morning. This morning in our gospel text, it says Jesus was on his way to Jerusalem. Jerusalem. This man was a man on a mission. He had places to go. He had things to do. As the text says, Jesus was walking ahead of him. It was kind of like Mark was talking about the fact that like Jesus is like power walking all the way to Jerusalem, right? He is like getting there. He is on his horse and he is riding. And the disciples are a little bit nervous about this. Now, I don't know if they're nervous because of the fact that he was going so fast they just had to try to keep up. I don't know if maybe they realized the fact that, that, you know, the chief priest and the scribes, they didn't so much like Jesus, right? And, and so he's making a beeline, though, to exactly where they are. And I'm sure the disciples are kind of like, what is about to happen? What are, what, what's about to go down right here? And in the midst of that walk, Jesus kind of stops and he turns around and he goes, listen to me carefully. We're on our way to Jerusalem. When we get there, I'm going to be betrayed by the religious leaders and scholars. They will sentence me to death. They'll hand me over to the Romans who will mock me, spit on me, give me the third degree, and then kill me. But after three days, I will rise alive. Now, this wasn't the first time that Jesus had told his disciples. In fact, uh, two chapters earlier in Mark chapter eight, Jesus tells his disciples exactly what's about to happen. And Peter looks at him and he's like, what? No way, right? And Jesus looks at Peter and he says, what? Get behind me, Satan. You have the things of man in mind, not the things of God. The next chapter in Mark chapter nine, uh, Jesus looks at him and again, tells him very plainly, this is what's about to go down. And they said nothing. In fact, they were silent and afraid, maybe because of the response that Peter got when he spoke up. But this time, this time after he tells them, the third time what is about to take place, James and John walk up to Jesus and like they just didn't listen to a word that he said. They're like, hey, can, can, you, can you do me a favor, Jesus? Can you do me a solid? And Jesus is like, well, wh- what do you want? And they say, let us sit at your right and your left when you come to your glory. Now, I don't know about you, but I could just imagine the look on Jesus' face when James and John asked this question, right? I mean, he probably was like, did you not just hear a word that I said? I mean, he probably had the look on, the fa- on his face because Jesus had just told him he was going to die. Now, we know that Jesus was going to war with sin, death, and the devil when he was going to die and rise, and that's why he had come. But James and John, they had something else in mind. You see, they probably believed that Jesus had come to to restore Israel, to to make Israel great again, to, to build up an earthly kingdom. In fact, a little bit later in Acts, they look at Jesus and say, after he had risen, Lord, is this the time you're gonna restore your kingdom? They they think it's gonna be an earthly thing, and when all the dust settles, well, they wanted to be in the places of honor of prestige, of power. The other disciples, having heard this, they became irritated. In fact, the Greek word actually means resentful. They didn't think it was fair that James and John would ask Jesus for this before they did. But how did Jesus respond? He, he looks at James and John and he, he kind of says to them, well, can you do what I'm about to do? I mean, he did tell them three times that he was going to be rejected, beat, suffer, and die, right? And of course, James and John are like, absolutely we can. <sighs> of course, you know, they back up that answer a little bit later in Mark chapter 14, when Jesus actually is arrested and they take off and run away. Jesus looks at him and he says, you know, come to think of it, you are going to experience what I'm about to experience. You're going to be rejected because of me. You're going to be beat because of me. You're going to suffer because of me. You're going to die because of me. I'm sure James and John were like, great. But then he goes on to say, but the places of honor, that's not my business. You see, Jesus was always subject to his father's will. 
He was always obeying his father. He was never overstepping what he was supposed to do, and he knew that that was God's the Father's place to put the person on his right and his left. You see, the problem with James and John is that they were earthly-minded. Do you know what it means to be earthly-minded? They were more about the now rather than the not yet. They, they struggled with things that earthly-minded people struggle with, right? Impurity, lust, anger, gossip, evil desires, greed. They tend to focus and ch- chase after the things here on earth, power, prestige, riches. Earthly-minded people only really think about themselves, they're kind of selfish at times. They, they wonder really how they can build their own kingdom rather than God's. They're typically more about their own will. This is what I want for my life than they are about God's will for their lives. Now, I'm sure that no one in here struggles with that, right? Not at all. I mean, I know I don't. But James and John were looking out for themselves. They cared more about their future, their position, than they did about the other disciples. They wanted to be the most important. They wanted to have the the promise of prestige and power and authority. Like I said, they made that request. And the disciples were, were really angry because they made it before they could. But is that what Jesus was all about? I mean, is, is that why he came? Is it, did he come to teach the disciples that it's all about the power and the prestige and the riches here on earth? No. In fact, he looks at him and he says, guys, you know the rulers of this world. They love to throw their weight around. They love to have absolute authority over people, but you must be different. Whoever wants to be the most important must be the servant to others. See, that's why I came, Jesus said. I'm the creator of the universe, but I didn't come here to be served. Rather, I came to serve and to give my life as a ransom for many. You see, the mission of Christ, it was a rescue mission. He he came to rescue you and me from sin, from death, and from the power of the devil. He came to live the life that we could not. He came to die the death we deserved. As it says in our Hebrews text, although Jesus was the Son of God, he learned to be obedient through his sufferings. After he'd finished his work, he became the source of eternal salvation for everyone who obeys him. It's at the cross where Christ would willingly suffer and sacrifice himself for us. He chose to lay down his life so that you and I could have life. The cross is the ultimate act of service. And through faith, we gain salvation through it. You see, we're connected to to Christ's cross, to his death and resurrection through faith. In our baptism, we died with Christ, and just as Christ has been raised, we too will rise. Paul talks about this in Romans chapter 6 when he says, don't you know that all of us who are baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? As Christ, Christ was brought back to life by the glorious power of the Father, so too will we rise to new life. You see, the gift of salvation is for everyone who believes. Through faith in Christ, God forgives our wickedness and no longer holds our sins against us. It doesn't matter who you are. It doesn't matter what you've done. He has taken away our shame and guilt. You are forgiven in the blood of the Lamb. He has given us new life, the promise of life eternal. Pretty awesome, amen? But I have to warn you, life with Jesus isn't always easy. To be honest, it could seem like it's a downright, upside-down kind of life. Why? Because we live in a broken world. You see, Christ calls us to do things that that are kind of out of the ordinary for our world and our culture. He he calls us to seek to serve others rather than to be be served. He, He calls us to strive not for power and prestige, but for opportunities to come alongside of others and love them where they are. 
to love as we've been loved by him, to serve as we've been served by him. Heck, look at St. Patrick, right? I mean, I'm sure that he was more than happy to leave Ireland to escape from the slavery and from the, 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 the persecution I'm sure he struggled with, but then to be sent right back to proclaim God's freedom and forgiveness to the ones who had kidnapped and enslaved him. Could you imagine that conversation with his mother? Patrick, you want to do what? Right? There are many things that constantly vie for our attention, that try to take our focus off of Christ, that easily cause us to to doubt and fall away. You see, on, on this side of heaven, we always struggle. We struggle with being earthly minded. We, we struggle with, against the devil and his minions. We, we struggle against the brokenness of the world around us. You see, as a result of following Christ, we too may find that we're called to suffer because of the gospel. Jesus even talked about it in John chapter 16 when he said, in this world you will have trouble. He told his disciples this. Guys, guess what? In this world you're going to have trouble. But cheer up, I've overcome the world. May Christ who has overcome fill us with his spirit so that we may live in the newness of life that he gives us each and every day through his death and resurrection, no matter what might happen on this side of heaven. May he strengthen us in our faith to serve as we have been served, to love as we have been loved. May he constantly remind us that no matter what we go through, we're not alone, but he is with us. And as Carl pointed out, there's a lot of crosses in here, right? Even around my neck. As we look at the cross, may we know and remember that through faith, we've been connected to Christ that we've been forgiven and set free, that we are loved, that we have been served, and that we have a new life. And may we live in that newness of life as we go from this place, as we encounter people where we live, learn, labor, and laugh. And may we share with them the hope that we have in Christ and because of him. Amen?
Let us pray. O God, by the passion of your beloved Son, you made an instrument of shameful death to be for us the means of life. Grant us so to glory in the cross of Christ that we may gladly suffer shame and loss for the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. I invite you to stand as we join Christians around the world confessing our faith in the triune God in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day he rose again. He descended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. We remain ever grateful and thankful for your tithes and your first fruit gifts. You, uh, you know by now how you can uh, get them to us in whichever way. Let's consecrate those gifts now. You are the King of Israel and David's royal son, now in the Lord's name coming, our King and Blessed One. As you receive our praises, accept the gifts we bring the source of every blessing, our good and gracious King. O holy and most merciful God, you have taught us the ways of your commandments. We implore you to pour out your grace into our hearts. Cause it to bear fruit in us, that being ever mindful of your mercies and your laws, we may always be directed to your will and daily increase in love toward you and one another. Enable us to resist all evil and to live a godly life. Help us to follow the example of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and to walk in his steps until we shall possess the kingdom that has been prepared for us. Lord, in your mercy. Lord Jesus, you invite all who are burdened with sin to come to you for rest. We now come at your invitation to the heavenly feast which you have provided for your children on earth. Preserve us from impenitence and unbelief. Cleanse us from our unrighteousness and clothe us with the righteousness purchased with your blood. Strengthen our faith, increase our love and hope, and assure us a place at your heavenly table where we will eat eternal manna and drink of the river of your pleasure forever and ever. Lord, in your mercy, we rejoice uh, with the family of Morgan May Baca, who was baptized uh, yesterday. Continue to be with this little one. Hold her in the very palm of your hand. Be with Stephen and Emily as they uh, raise her in uh, the truth that you have set before them. And thank you for the blessings of uh, baptism which Morgan received that promise of eternal life and the forgiveness of her sins. Lord, in your mercy, we pray for those uh, in our midst who are hurting in mind, body, or spirit. Some of those we name silently now. And a few I name aloud for Michelle and Walter, Christina and Phyllis, and Mary and Heidi, Suzanne and Fred and Levi, for Ron, for Tom, Liz, and Shirley. Continue to hold each of these, your children, in your powerful hands. Uplift them, strengthen them. Be with doctors and nurses who are ministering to some, and be with family members who are caring for others. Lord, in your mercy. This prayer I've offered aloud and others that we've said silently, we now bind together in the prayer your Son has taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, 
hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. It's at this time that, that we participate in Christ's true body and blood in, with, and under the bread and the wine that we receive. It is, it is the medicine we need for our soul. For that earthly-minded struggle we have, it helps us to overcome and be strengthened. Our Lord Jesus Christ, the night when he's betrayed, took bread and we give him thanks. He broke it, gave it to his disciples and said, take and eat, this is my body which is given for you, this do in remembrance of me. In the same way also he took the cup after supper and we had given thanks. He gave it to them and said, drink of this all of you. This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of all your sins. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always. I invite you to share that peace with one another.
Now may this, the very body and blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, strengthen you and preserve you and keep you in the one true faith unto life everlasting. Depart in peace. Amen. Let us pray. Gracious God, Heavenly Father, we are grateful for the gift of your Son, our Savior. As always, we thank you today for this gift, his body and blood given for us for the forgiveness of our sins and that promise of eternal life which you will grant each of us one day. Help it to continue to make us strong to do the work that you have for each of us to do. It's in your son's name we pray, amen. A few short announcements uh, as we conclude worship today. Please greet each other uh, as you leave. There's uh, some goodies out there in Friendship Square if you would like. Uh, this week, one more uh, Lenten worship service Wednesday, uh, 12 noon at Holy Cross and 6.30 here at Bethany. Um, page six here, join us for an Easter extravaganza, children and families, that's 11 a.m. Uh, next Sunday on Palm Sunday here in Bethany's gym. There's information there. And if you are coming, they would like you to sign up uh, by tomorrow. There's a QR code in that. You can read more about that. Uh, there's also um, Holy Week uh, calendar after next Sunday, Palm Sunday, and that week that's all printed as well. I invite you to stand now and receive the uh, blessing and then join in our closing hymn. Chosen, dear, loved, and holy in Jesus, freed to serve your neighbor and created in Christ for good works, go under his blessing that you may be a blessing in the name of our life-giving Lord. Amen.
Go in peace and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God.